Hello, everyone. So we're starting today's colloquium. And today we're deep diving into the topic of equivalent circuits and how to construct them when interpreting the electrochemical impedance data. Among all these electrochemical techniques that we use, uh, impedance spectroscopy is probably the least understood method. And in literature, you can find numerous cases of misinterpretation and incorrect feeding of the spectra. So previously here, we already hosted two colloquiums on this topic, and you can find them on our YouTube channel. But because the equivalent circuit analysis raises so many questions within the community, I think it's super important to dedicate an entire colloquium to this topic. So the person who will help us today understand this equivalent circuit analysis better is our today's speaker, Professor David Harrington. He is one of the best experts in electrochemical impedance and physical electrochemistry, including electrocatalysis. So David got his PhD in 1982 from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And then later he held postdoc positions at both the US and Canada. And since 1987, he has been a professor at the Department of Chemistry at the University of Victoria in Canada. So David, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really happy to host you here. And now the stage is yours. Great, thank you very much for the invitation, Andrew. Let me just share the screen here. Okay, so um, as Andrew said, uh, there's a lot of um, misinterpretations in the literature about how to connect things up. And so Andrew asked me to talk about this issue of how do you connect the different elements of equivalent circuits together? And so I'll, I'll tell you right off that that's a very difficult thing to get exactly correct. So what I will mainly do um, is I will mainly um, give you an idea of the pitfalls so that you can decide whether something is sensible or not. And maybe to go to that next step, you have to do some kinetic analysis. So this is a short outline here, and I won't go over uh, everything on the list, but I will just say that always at the back of it is the idea that the whole point of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy um, I'm assuming that you actually want to find out about some physical phenomena uh, that's going on. And so your real objective is to, to understand what, for example, if it's a reaction mechanism, which is mostly what I'll talk about, what are the rate constants of the steps and how many adsorbed species are on the surface and actually extract some, some numbers out of that. And so that's always the objective at the back of your mind. And so then the question is, well, you, you have an equivalent circuit. How did you construct it? Did you use the theory to get there or did you just put it together? And if you just put it together, then interpreting what actually happens has a number of pitfalls. Uh, so let's get started here. Uh, and so I will assume you know a little bit about impedance. Um, and maybe have seen an impedance spectrum. Uh, so I'll have one introductory slide here uh, just to perhaps get, get you the notation. So uh, in electrical impedance spectroscopy, we have a small AC sine wave perturb perturbation of, of a voltage E, uh, or I'll call it V if we're doing some circuit theory. It's a small amplitude, a few millivolts, uh, on top of a DC signal. And in response to that, we get some current or current density, which are called J, uh, and that has an amplitude and it's phase shifted. Uh, the crests and waves don't turn up by this phase angle phi here. And so the way that we will analyze that is we'll draw these phases in the complex plane and we'll assume that the Stimulus, the potential uh, is real, and the response, the current or current density, uh, has a magnitude and it has a phase angle, 
And so it's associated with a complex number. And then impedance is just dividing the complex number for voltage divided by the complex number for current. And the admittance uh, is one over that. I'll use this notation here where I is the square root of minus one. If you're an engineer, you probably will have a J there. Um, so I'll use the, the IUPAC notation here. And frequency F, omega is two pi times F. And, and I'll use the shorthand S here for I omega. Um, it's basically, at the moment it'll be I omega. We'll see later that it, it can have, it be a little bit more complicated. Um, so we make a measurement and at one frequency, we, we, we get one point here on this Nyquist plot, which is a plot of the impedance in the complex plane with the real and imaginary parts or minus imaginary part as we conventionally plot it. Uh, and then we see something like a semicircle or a few semicircles. Uh, and then we interpret this in terms of a circuit and perhaps you've seen this one. Um, where, for example, this RS here is associated with this distance here on intercept here. The diameter of this semicircle is the value of this resistor. And the capacitance, the information about that is encoded in how these things are spreaded, spread around here. And for example, what is the top frequency of the semicircle? You'll also see this Boda plot here, uh, which is also useful. It seems to be um, some straight line section. So something like straight line here represents a resistor. Uh, straight line here, slope of minus one represents a capacitor. And straight line slope here represents the resistor. And you can read the values off of the resistors and capacitors from this. And I'll, just to give you a heads up, these places where there are bends are associated with what are called poles and zeros in circuit theory. And so knowing where they are and where these sections begin and end can be useful. Okay, so that's the introduction. Um, let's talk now about just some simple theory for the conventional elements, resistor, capacitor, and inductor. So resistance uh, is given by dV dI, and you'll notice I'm not using Ohm's law V over I here, and all of my definitions here are in terms of derivatives. And so R here will not necessarily obey Ohm's law. It's what's called a differential resistance. And so this is the definition of these in the time domain, the impedance of those, the impedance of a resistor is just R. And so in fact, impedance is just some sort of generalization of the idea of resistance to include phase shifts um, in case things aren't, aren't in phase. Capacitance is defined as I is C dV dt. Uh, and so it has an admittance, which is given by S times C, where that is S again is I omega. And uh, things that are interesting to remember about a capacitance, it's a very high frequency. It looks just like a short circuit or a wire. And at very low frequencies, it's an open circuit. It's like you didn't have the element there at all. And it's often useful in these circuits to think about the high and low frequency limits. For an inductor, the potential is the inductance times di dt. An inductor has an impedance, which is S times L. And so it's sort of the other way around in some sense. At high frequencies, it's like it wasn't there or was open circuit. And at low frequencies, it's like it's just a wire. The only other things we need to know to construct circuits are that if things are in series here, the same current flows through one, it then flows through the other. So I1 here and I2 are the same and that's the sort of the key feature of some elements in series the voltages across each of these will add together to give the voltage over the whole thing 
And on, on the other hand, for parallel elements, then uh, our, our current splits up I1 and I2, and the total I is the sum of those two. And the potential, potential difference across each of them is the same. And so if you've got things in series, you add their impedances. And if you've got things in parallel, you add their admittances. And so this is enough information to construct the impedance expression uh, for any circuit. So I want to start by deriving a very, very simple admittance. I'm not going to derive many things here, but I just wanted to give you this simplest example in order to see um, how, how this works. So let's take the case of a diode. A diode has this uh, defining current voltage relationship, uh, which is plotted there. So that's, this is uh, an ideal diode. It has that current voltage all the time, no matter whether we're going slowly or fast, but let's suppose that we call that the steady state behavior. So I'm going to apply my voltage here. It has a steady state component and a small perturbation which in impedance is a sine wave. And we're going to do a little shorthand, call that exponential I omega T. And here's our complex number telling us about its phase and magnitude. And the response will be a current, which will also have a steady state component and a little bit uh, of a perturbation. So in, in a picture, you can think of us doing a little AC on here which induces a little AC in the current. And so we know this function for current to potential. And so what is it when we take the function of the steady state plus uh, the little perturbation? Well, a Taylor series would say, okay, it's the function at the steady state plus the derivative uh, at the steady state times the perturbation plus some smaller terms, which we're gonna throw away. And so then, since I know that my steady state current is the function of the steady state voltage, I can cancel those guys out. And now I have that delta I, my response is related to my stimulus um, with this coefficient here. And if I write that out in terms of the I omegas, exponential I omegas, they cancel out. And I find that my admittance, which is my complex number here over my complex number there is just this function. It was just the slope of the function. And we'll, that will be one over the resistor value. So the resistor is related to the slope of this line. It's one over the slope of that line. And so my linearized circuit is just a resistor. So my real circuit is a diode, but my linearized circuit is a resistor. And so, so long as we keep the amplitude small, my response is linear with my stimulus, uh, but we usually in an impedance exper experiment, we choose some small amplitude here and we don't normally uh, vary that. But if we did, so long as we didn't go too big, uh, then our response is proportional to our stimulus. So we say the system is linear. Okay, so what, what can we do with this? We, we took the real circuit, which was a diode, and we turned it into an equivalent circuit, which was a resistor. And so I want to make this distinction about a, a real circuit and an equivalent circuit is this, this linearized one that you'd use for impedance. And so for example, if I found that we're working at some particular potential, let's say 0.2 volts and that resistance which is related to that slope of that curve, remember, is let's say 10.7 ohms. So let's make a small step. We'll step from 0.2 volts by uh, just one millivolt. And so the actual change, if you work it out from the full nonlinear equation, um, the I will change by 95.4 microamps. But if I use my linearized equation where my Admittance is one over R. My, I find my response is 
the one over r times delta v, I'll find 93.5. Pretty good, right? So, so long as I keep that uh, amplitude small, this thing works. But let's suppose I do, do a big step now, a step from 0.2 to 0.3 volts. Uh, then I might calculate my final current from Ohm's law and decide it was about five milliamps, but that's not actually correct. The final current is 120 milliamps. Um, and so what we can deduce from our equivalent circuit, our measured or, or derived admittances or impedances, they are transfer functions only for small signals. So if they're okay for tiny steps or, and they're okay for impedance, but they are not okay for figuring out a DC current through the circuit. So you cannot take an equivalent circuit and say, oh, well, if I pass these currents through at DC, I can do any sort of calculations with them. And that's because when we linearized, we threw away information. And so in this, case of the diode, our resistance value is only good at that potential. If I now change the DC potential to a new impedance experiment, I have a new resistance, uh, which again will only be useful for small perturbations around that. Um, I use the word transfer function here. So transfer function means um, our response. Um, so our emittance, for example, is the current it's, this is the response, and this was the stimulus. And so mostly we are doing potentiostatic experiments and where we are applying the, and controlling the voltage and measuring the current. And in uh, linear systems theory, uh, the transfer function is the trans transformed output over input. And so that's always the admittance for potentiostatic experiments. So when we do impedance, we should really be doing admittance. We should plot everything as admittance uh, and we should do our analysis and admit in admittance. Um, but we're used to looking at impedance spectra. So of course I'll be showing those, but the Behind this all, I'm making the assumption that you are doing a potential static experiment. You really should be thinking about admittance all the time. I'll come back to that point later, but otherwise I'm going to assume that like most experiments, we're working potential statically. Okay, so let's take some electrochemistry now. I'll take a very simple reaction. I've got high concentrations of reactions and products. So there's no ma fast, mass transport is fast. I don't have to worry about it. Constant concentrations, uh, no adsorption on the surface. All I've got is electron transfer here. So I can write down some kinetics for that. Uh, the rate here uh, of that step, step one, uh, and I'll use my rates will be in uh, moles per square meter per second. Uh, there's some rate constant for the forward uh, part of the reaction, a reverse rate constant, and these depend on potential. Uh, and then we work out the Faradayic component of the current by J over F is equal to, actually this should be plus V1 because we, uh, ma we made one electron in this reaction step. So that's the kinetics we need. And all that really matters here is that V1 is a function of potential. And so the current is a function of potential. And that's exactly like our diode. And so we have some curve here, which depends on what function of these, of potential these rate constants are. Um, we have some conventions in electrochemistry that we often write this in this sort of TAFL form, but it doesn't have to be. It's some uh, dependence on potential and that's all I need to know. And it's just like the diode, it'll come out to be the equivalent circuit is a resistor. So 
I got there, I found the type of the equivalent circuit. I didn't need to know the detailed potential dependence of the rate constants, only that they depended some way in potential. If I want the sign of this resistor, I need to know that the slope of this thing uh, is positive, um, but it's a resistor just because it, it's something that depends on potential. And so I measure that resistor. How does that resistor now? So I do that's at one potential. I'm going to do, repeat the experiment at many different potentials. And what will I get? I'll find that I plotted log of one over RCT here. Um, we'll call it a charge transfer resistance. In this particular case, I could also call it a polarization resistance. And it's related to the slope of that uh, curve. And if I put the numbers in, if this is a Butler-Volmer equation, uh, as we usually assume, then my RCT is like this. And you'll notice that it's it working the way we expected. I've got um, the this one over RCT is r the slope of this line here. Uh, this one's on log scale, so they're not. It's not immediately apparent. So the value gets higher as the slope gets higher. It comes down to some minimum value that we have at zero over potential and then it goes up on the other side. So basically we're measuring something that is the slope of the thing that we probably want to figure out. We threw some information away when we linearized the circuit, but if we now have measured it at all different potentials, we could imagine uh, reconstructing that um, reconstructing this curve. So we could start here, for example, where we know the current is zero and measure RCT, and that would give us this slope here. And then we could say, okay, so the current here, I can get that from the slope. And now I go me measure the slope, measure RCT again, which is the slope. And I could work my way up this curve and effectively uh, integrate this to get this. So I could do some reconstruction of what the overall behavior was by having measured this thing at many different uh, potentials. And so this is a, a, you know, the take home message here is you measure it a bunch of as, as many potentials as you can, and then it's the potential dependence of, so the fact that this is a resistor doesn't tell us a lot, but if I measure it at many different um, potentials and I, I can get the maximum amount of information about and decide, for example, whether these rate constants are in fact exponential with potential or something else is, is happening. So that was just <clears throat> the Faradaic part. So just a reminder here that we have an electrochemistry uh, and in all my talk, I'm just assuming a single interface, not a cell. Uh, you can put the pieces together to make a cell. But we have an electrochemical interface with a potential profile across it here. Um, and we are oscillating the potential. We are changing that slope uh, slightly as we oscillate. And as we do that, the electrons jump across the interface according to these reactions. We call that a Faraday current. And as well, to change the potential, we need to bring ions in from the solution, which charges the double layer, increases the electric field, and we get a, a charging current. So it's not related to the reaction. So the total current through my circuit is a charging current, uh, plus a Faraday current. And then out in solution, that current uh, is, uh, there's some, uh, the ions have to travel through and there's a certain speed they can go for, which is related to the resistance of the solution. So this is, is 
we're going to always assume that this is the case. It's just we don't know what's going on here. And that's what we're wanting to investigate. But I look at this and I immediately want to say, okay, here, the metal side of the interface is this point right here, X. And this point here, Y, corresponds to just outside the double layer. And then this point here uh, corresponds to at the tip of my reference electrode. So we'll assume that. And in some sense, that's a real circuit. If I put my butler volma thing in here, and when I linearize it, in the case we just saw, that becomes a resistor. If I want to really solve this whole electrochemistry problem, there are lots of differential equations and so on to solve in the general case. But often the, electric, the equivalent circuit is significantly simpler. So just bear in mind that we get equivalent circuits and now let's, we need to think about them. So let's think about that reaction we were just talking about, but add diffusion to it. So if we do that, our kinetics have changed a little bit. Our concentration that matters is the concentration at the interface, which can be changing now because of diffusion. And so the surface concentration at the interface, I'll put a little superscript S here, it's going to depend on solving a diffusion equation out into solution. That's a compl complicated piece of math, but when I do that, I find that we get some sort of Warburg uh, impedance. If I have semi-infinite diffusion, then it's some constant times S to the minus a half. And the circuit that I had when I had fast mass transport with no diffusion, we just had this resistor here and I connected it up to my double layer capacitance and my solution resistance, as we just said, here's my point X in the middle, here's my point Y, just outside the double layer, here's my reference electrode. And now what do I find when I derive that equivalent circuit by some complicated math? I find that RCT is sitting here uh, and the Warburg is connected to it in series. Uh, and now I think this is the metal and point Z is the um, end of the reference electrode. But where is the outside of the double layer? So I want to put it here because that's the other side of the double layer capacitance. But on the other hand, I know that RCT has to do with um, the electron transfer jumping across that interface. So maybe I should put Y here. And so, this is an example that immediately shows you, even though this is probably one of those common equivalent circuits that we ever see, um, it's not obvious why it should be connected that way. Uh, but we all accept this as being fine because we know we can derive it mathematically uh, in some way. And so, if I do that mathematics, I find my sigma prime is RCT, which is related to the slope of my curve, and it's got the rate constants in some diffusion coefficients. Uh, and it looks kind of complicated, but more importantly, it seems to be more than just diffusion. So these diffusion coefficients, I expected them I've got some rate constants and I might say, okay, because it's coupled with a reaction at the interface, but I didn't perhaps expect to see RCT here because I've already got RCT over here. Why have I got RCT in my Warburg? And I might say, well, that's related perhaps to this issue of where I stuck it in the equivalent circuit. My Faraday, can impedance, if I derive it, that's the way it is. And this sigma prime has got RCT in. So perhaps you think, okay, well, maybe I can try and get my point Y here and point X by, instead of using the regular Warburg, I'll use something else here. 
And you can try that and you can have some sort of complicated element here, but it still involves RCT. So this is an important point that this thing that we thought was related to just diffusion is related to more than that. And that's just true generally when you measure physical quantities, there are often there's a couple of parameters which are lumped together, which you can never separate. Now, if you were wanting to get kinetics out of here, what could you do? Well, you could just say, okay, well, that's RCT times one plus this thing, which is all of that. And then say, okay, I'm just gonna fit directly to this. And I think in this case, that's a great idea. Uh, we've, then I would separate, I'd not have RCT in both my things that I was fitting. I'd have RCT here and I'd have this quantity separately. It's a nicer split. It means I disregarded the equivalent circuit and I went directly to the kinetics. But perhaps I needed to see this impedance spectrum to know that I had that equivalent circuit, to know that I could do this analysis. And even then, at the end of the day, I have a mixture of diffusion coefficients and rate constants. Okay, so let's just summarize the first part of the talk there. Um, I have real circuit with the diode, a capacitor and a resistance, its equivalent circuit would have the diode replaced by a resistance. Our interface reaction there, which was replaced by a resistance, that's the real circuit and the equivalent circuit. So some points to remember now about equivalent circuits. The elements are differential. Resistances measure slopes of current potential curves. Same with capacitors, they're differential capacitors. So they're not like regular Ohm's law does not apply. So therefore they cannot be used for DC or steady state. And as we saw with the, the um, Randall circuit case with the Warburg, the connections don't need to be the way you might expect in a real system. The element values, they usually don't represent a single physical or kinetic phenomenon. The double A capacitance is probably an exception in this case. And if you want to extract the most information, you're going to need to make these measurements repeatedly at different potentials and then see how the element values change with potential. And then according to this paper here, analysis at all potentials enables the full reconstruction of the nonlinear um, behavior. So often, of course, you can't measure at all potentials. So you, you fall well short of that goal, but in ultimately a complete study of potential dependence is what you want to do. Okay, let's take, <clears throat> the case of the hydrogen evolution reaction. So now fast mass transport, I've still got that for my green species here, H plus, but now I've got adsorbed species and they've got some coverage theta here and I've got some reaction sites which also have some coverage. So I've introduced adsorption into this thing. My kinetics now have some thetas in. Uh, I have three steps and now my Faraday current is the rate of production of electrons and I have removal of one electron in step one, removal of one electron in step two. And I also have a differential equation here for the rate of production of my adsorbed species, which I'll call R theta. It's produced once in step one, it's removed once in step two, and it's removed twice in step three. So that's the kinetics. And then I linearize it, and what do I get? Well, there's a theory for this, and I'll just write, this is the only one I'm gonna write down just as an example here. The impedance, and that includes the double air capacitance here, can be written in terms of these partial derivatives, which tells how these rates of production, which depend on all different steps, uh, which in turn depend on potential and coverage, 
uh, I've written in this matrix here or determinant of this matrix. And this row and column has something to do with electrons. This has something to do with electrons. And this has something to do with the adsorbed species. This has something to do with the adsorbed species. And all I'm going to say at the moment is that the one on top here has only to do with adsorbed species. And in fact, this part on top is the submatrix down here. So if I take this one in the bottom and I strip away anything to do with electrons, I'm left with the adsorption problem. Uh, and that submatrix uh, is the one that appears on the top. So if I expand out determinants, I get ratios of polynomial. So a determinant, if I expand it out, it's a determinant with the mo some S's there. I expand it out, I get a polynomial in S, and the one on the bottom is a poly another polynomial in S. And I always I get a ratio of polynomials in S, and sometimes called a rational function. And so that's generally true for mechanisms with adsorption, uh, electron transfer, but fast mass transport. And so we're just going to consider that case, subcase uh, going forward. And so this sort of impedance, uh, irrational function, uh, is exactly the sort of impedance that you get in circuit theory when you have capacitors, resistors, and inductors. And so that's why um, the, we can convert this to a circuit. And there are rules in circuit theory. Once you've got this, so you did the kinetics here, you converted it to your rational function. There are rules to go from there to the circuit. So I'm not going to give those exact rules, but I am going to say how complicated can it be? And these were the rules for when you've got adsorbed species, fast mass transport, you'll get resistors, capacitors, and inductors. And so in the hydrogen evolution reaction, we've got three steps. So maybe we get three semicircles. It's tempting to think that. So let's, there's a theory about that, um, which I'll briefly mention here, is that if I throw away my Mass, uh, my um, fast mo moving species in solution because they're essentially constants in my kinetics and I just keep the electrons and the adsorbed species and I then re I re I'll write reaction one backwards and I'll add it to reaction two, I'll get reaction three. So in other words, I can cr create reaction three from reactions one and two, steps one and two. So only two of those reactions are independent. So we could say the number of independent reactions is two. And now we're gonna play this game one more time, but now throw away electrons. And if I throw away electrons, then all my reactions look essentially the same. Uh, if I take the third one, I'll have to divide it by two, but it's, it's a scaled version. There's only one essential reaction once I've thrown away the electrons. So I'll say there's one independent reaction. When I've thrown away electrons, I'll call that I prime. And so now that tells me that the number of elements in my circuit with the double layer is four. If I add solution resistance, which I'll sometimes put in and sometimes won't, um, there'll be five. I can figure out the number of resistors, there'll be two, the number of capacitors or inductors. And I can also figure, figure out from the difference in these, uh, whether there's a DC path through the circuit and that will correspond to a mechanism which is passing current. If my, so if the, that difference is one, there will be a DC path through the circuit. And if that difference is zero, there won't be a path through the circuit. And that is sort of a criterion now for constructing the circuit. And so both of these circuits here that you find for the hydrogen evolution reaction satisfy that. You'll see the numbers of the things are right. 
And if I think about this DC path, there's clearly, if, if I were, if this were a DC circuit, there's a DC path through here, or in this version through here. Uh, and that will, that's something we predicted from this reaction. There are two forms here. And so you might get this inductive form at some potentials and inductors show this loop under the axis. And at other potentials, you might get uh, capacitors and two semicircles looking like that. Now it's actually true for hydrogen evolution reaction. You need a, there's a quite small parameter range where you'd actually see the inductive behavior. So those circuits are both acceptable and that's, we can figure out how many elements there have to be. That's too complicated. So that rule can be generalized to include diffusing species, but it's much too complicated uh, for this talk. And so I just want to give you a simpler rule. When you've only got adsorption, then all you have to do is, if there's no adsorbed species, it's our semicircle. That, that was true for our simple electron transfer reaction. And this one's got a DC path. Um, I add an adsorbed species and I get an extra semicircle. So in some sense, this is for the double layer capacitance. And this is for my adsorbed species. Uh, this is RCT more or less. And I got a second semicircle for my one adsorbed species. And it might look like this, or it might look like that, as we've seen, or it might even look like this. But the fact there's two semicircles is a signal for one adsorbed species. On the other hand, if we don't have that DC path, that second semicircle turns into a vertical line. And so that's the case with the no DC path. And so this extends on, if I had two, ad two adsorbed species, you get three semicircles and so on. So this, the question is the complexity due to the number of steps? The answer is no, it's more to do with the number of adsorbed species here. Okay, I want to think about charge transfer and polarization resistances. So I'm going to have a working electrode and my, I'm going to imagine I've got some adsorbed species here sitting on the surface. And now I'm going to change the potential across that interface. And I can do that as fast as I can bring the ions out. So I need some extra ions to get my higher electric field. Uh, and therefore I needed to bring ions up from to the double layer and that takes a little bit of time. But if I can do that fast enough that these adsorbed species are, don't have a chance to react, then the change in the current the Faraday current, as I change that potential, keeping the conditions at the interface constant is how we define RCT. So RCT is the electron transfer rate can change immediately, the field changes, but we freeze out everything else. Now on a slower time scale, these guys might want to absorb, desorb, for example, and at the end of the day, I reach steady state, I've desorbed them and there were some flow, slower things happen, that happened. And the slope of our uh, steady state polarization curve uh, or one over that is uh, we'll call the polarization resistance RP. So the simple reactions we saw so far, RCT and RP were the same, um, but in general, RP, includes information about all the slower things going on. And RCT is if I did the just the electron transfers and nothing else. So that tells us what we expect at high and low frequencies. So just to emphasize that the polarization resistance is the slope of my steady state current potential curve. Um, and so here I am, my slope is positive. Um, my RP is positive, my low frequency intercept, my impedance has to be here. 
if I've got some sort of inhibit inhibition process going on, uh, then my RP will be negative and I will end up at low frequencies over on the negative side. And so negative resistances are going to be associated at least at the low frequencies with some sort of inhibition or whatever phenomenon reduce is causing this slope here to be negative. What about if I just had an adsorption reaction like UPD hydrogen on platinum, there's the reaction. If I measure the steady state current potential curve, what do I get? Well, I'm at some coverage. There is no, that's the equilibrium coverage. There's no current. I step my potential, I wait to get a new equilibrium coverage, the reaction stops, there's no current. So in this case, the steady state current, which is also the equilibrium current in this case, uh, is always zero. And so that's the case where the slope is uh, zero. So I expect RP to be infinity. I expect my impedance to go to infinity. And this is exactly the case where there's no DC path because the reaction stops, current is zero, and steady state current is zero. So that we can think of that as being the polarization thing went to infinity at the very lowest frequencies, up it goes to infinity. And so this is the circuit we get for that. And you'll see there's no DC path because at DC, remember this, capacitor here is like we took it away and same with this one and so there's no way to get current through this circuit um, because those capacitors don't pass current at DC. So we see that looking at this um, low and high frequencies can help us out. So let's think about the high, high frequency, the charge transfer resistance it, for any mechanism the Faraday admittance or impedance, I guess that should be uh, one over RCTs, the Faraday admittance at highest frequency. So you can show that it doesn't matter what the mechanism is, it'll always look at a resist, the Faraday part will always look at, like a resistor. And then we've got that resistor and also the double layer capacitance. And so if I look at this circuit here and I think about, okay, high frequencies, my adsorption is going to look like that, capacitors look like wires, this capacitor looks like a wire, but I'm going to leave the double layer capacitance. We're not going quite that high of frequency. So then what will I see? Well, then all of this is short circuited by this. And so it's like I didn't have this part of the circuit and I've got RCT must be all that's left. If I look at this circuit, then that one gets shorted, that one gets shorted. And what's left is a, some parallel combination of these. So RCT is the parallel combination of these in this case. So what about the sign of RCT? So I'm going to uh, say R RCT is always positive because if I go back to my little picture of the changing the electric field, if I increase the electric field, I increase the drive for electrons to, to go across the interface, the current tends to increase. And so the RCT is positive. Now, I sometimes see things where people say, oh, I've got a negative RCT. So, I would say that's an apparent RCT and you can imagine something happening like this. So I have this circuit here and maybe this uh, one here is negative, but RCT is positive. Now the reaction perhaps is very fast, which means that RCT is approximately zero. So this is very small. We hardly see it. It's almost like a wire. And now what, now what do I see? I see those two combined. And I see the thing that was negative now looks as though it's RCT. So if I think about RCT a little bit more, that was the one we got where we suddenly increased the field and we didn't give anything at this interface a chance to 
adjust the coverages or the concentrations. And so if there's many reactions going on and I've suddenly increased the rate of all of them, the idea of a rate determining step is not relevant. And so I should not expect to learn anything about which of the fast and slow steps in that because they'll all respond. On the other hand, if I do a steady state curve, then I can do some analysis. And for example, in this case, if this step is uh, slow and this step is fast, then some sort of analysis would tell you that the alpha value might be 1.5. You've got one electron in a pre-equilibrium step and one electron in the rate determining step, the sort of Bokras analysis that you would do for steady state. But RCT doesn't know about that. And so if I put these rate constants in, I find that RCT, um, the true RCT I'm talking about here, uh, has a different TAFL plot. In other words, if I plot a log of RCT, its slope is different from the steady state one. And so I don't learn anything about the mechanism, which, which is rate determining step. So we, we need to be careful that it's RP, TAFL plots of RP might tell you something because they're related to steady state, but TAFL plots of RCT don't actually tell you anything about the mechanism. And this is a common mistake to, to assume that they do. Okay, let's just look at some adsorption mechanisms as, as examples of equivalent circuits. I have a simple adsorption reaction, for example, hydrogen UPD, um, and I have one adsorbed species. Is there a DC path? No, because the reaction finishes, you know, I, I move to my equilibrium coverage and the DC current is zero. So I'm gonna put one adsorbed species, no DC path. And I'll, I'll let you do the I's and I primes, but we have a simpler rule now. So this is their circuit, RCT for electron transfer. I've got C representing adsorption uh, and there's no, no DC path. We saw that already for this case. Let's suppose that I could make this adsorbed hydrogen from two sources, from um, H plus or from let's say HSO4 minus. So now I ask myself, and again, you know, the, the fast mass transport for the guys in green. So there's only one adsorbed species here. And again, at the end of the day, they'll come to whatever coverage they want to be and the reaction stops and there's no DC current. So I expect the same circuit. So even though I've got two ways of making this one adsorbed species, I won't see an extra capacitor here representing anything and my RCT will have will be a com have information about both those electron transfers combined. Okay, so let's take a case with two adsorbed species coming from, for example, I make OH from water and I make adsorbed hydrogen sulfate from sulfuric acid. Still no DC path. Uh, and so I will get now this time, I, I expect to get two um, capacitors uh, in the circuit. Um, things are now reflecting the fact that I've got two adsorbed species on the surface. Let's look at this case. I make one adsorbed species, but I make it from two different things uh, in different oxidation states. And you look at this and you say, okay, I've only got one adsorbed species. And then you say, okay, well, after they're adsorbed, the reaction will be over and the current steady state current should be zero. But if you work through the I and the I prime thing, you'll realize that that is wrong. And it's because you can adsorb in one of these reactions and then desorb it in the other one. And so there is a possible overall reaction associated with changing that oxidation state. And so the actual, the will actually be current in this case. So we go back to yes, 
And this is the case with one adsorbed species where we have a DC path and we get the same sort of circuit as we saw for the hydrogen evolution reaction. Okay, so let's just summarize now where we are at this point. So the complexity doesn't depend simply on the number of steps. So elements, they don't correspond to steps. And so when I put that resistance in the circuit for the hydrogen evolution reaction, its value depends on all the steps there. Same, pro same thing we had with the Randall circuit things are always mixed up in terms of uh, fundamental parameters. There's no simple correspondence to steps. And generally each element value depends on kinetic parameters from multiple steps. We can predict the maximum number of elements. That's what we were predicting here. We, just as for the diode, we didn't need to know much about it. Here we don't need to know the rate constants, just that they do depend on potential. I used the Langmuir isotherm, but I could have used some other isotherm. And in general, uh, the details of that don't affect the type of the equivalent circuit we're going to get. They, of course, affect the values of the elements. And so I can figure out the complexity of the circuit. That is the maximum complexity. I'll find it at some potentials, but maybe at other potentials, it'll look simpler. And I'll come back later and talk about that aspect. So you can show that you expect to see most structure complexity at equilibrium. And as you get a higher over potentials, something will become so fast that you may maybe don't see it and things get simpler. So if you can, you should measure things close to around equilibrium. You, that will be the, where you have the best chance of figuring out what's, the, what's going on in, in the most detail. There's some other theory that says you can show there's no inductors at equilibrium. And so there are these other clues that, um, for example, about when you get inductors in general that, that you can work out, though they're, they're not that simple. We can predict the low frequency behavior just from the steady state current potential curve. The highest frequency semicircle is always gonna be RCT and CDL. Uh, unless, of course, RCT has got so small we can't see it. And just to remind you, we shouldn't use RCT unless it is also RP, uh, and of course that is sometimes the case, uh, to diagnose our mechanism. Okay, so I want to spend the next few slides just thinking about the meaning of resistance, capacitance, and inductance. So we said RCT was associated with electron transfer. But I can think about a process without electron transfer. I've got some molecules that maybe have dipoles and they sit up on the surface and at low coverages, they, they go flat on the surface. And I've got some double layer charges here. I might expect to see a change in capacitance as I, so these ions can get closer or not so close to the interface. So I might expect that if I flip these things up one or uh, just to get a, a change in capacitance. But so long as there's some delay here and it takes time to do this, you, the actual predicted circuit is the one we just saw where we had an electron transfer reaction. So it's not so much that it's charge transfer, it's the fact that there was a energy barrier to go over in one case, it was electron transfer, uh, but in this case, it's the reorientation of the molecule is an activated process. And so resistors are associated with processes that are activated, they dissipate energy, and that's really what we expect from resistors. And so all the resistors are, their sort of function in the circuit is, is to dissip, associated with dissipating energy. On the other hand, capacitors are associated and inductors are associated with energy storage. And so I want to make this point here about real circuits, they have positive elements and capacitors store energy in electric field, inductors store energy in a magnetic field. 
But we're working with equivalent circuits. And so capacitors, yes, the double layer capacitor stores energy and electric field. But these other capacitors and these inductors, which maybe I should call them pseudo capacitors and pseudo inductors, the energy there is stored in a chemical bond. <clears throat> so if I, you know, there it is, it's the, the, the actual bond. And so if I pass electrons through this reaction, I make the bond, it's storing energy in the bond. And then if I desorb, the electron goes out and it's like I stored the electron in the bond and I could take it out again when I removed the bond. So I didn't invoke electric fields there in order to get that capacitor. So that this capacitor here is not associated with electric field. In the same way, inductors here are not associated with magnetic field. Now, some people will tell you that, oh, you can't have an inductor in an electrochemical circuit because there are no magnetic fields. Sure, there are no magnetic fields, but these inductors and capacitors are there to represent adsorption and to give, you can think of them as what are they there for? Well, if we only had resistors, we'd get no phase shift, everything would be in phase. So they're there to give us whatever the phase shift we need that the kinetics predicts. And so definitely there's nothing more un unusual about inductors here than capacitors. Neither of them are doing what they would do in the real circuits. Okay, now circuit ambiguities. So it turns out all of these circuits here give the same impedance. And some people say, okay, now it's hopeless. Because there's ambiguities, we shouldn't use equivalent circuits at all. But as I'll show you in a second, that's also true for reaction mechanisms. And so, but that's what we want to study. And so there are better and worse circuits here. And so I want to say just a little bit about this. So I can write the actual impedances out using those rules that we saw earlier. Uh, and they, the impedances come in different forms here for those different circuits. But they all simplify to this ratio of polynomials, our rational function. And so if this is all that the, the most important thing, then it doesn't really matter which circuit I use. I can factor those polynomials and get these roots here. Uh, and in fact, there's, there's some circuit theory, which I'm using. These are fairly standard forms of the circuit. And they, these first two here, if I look at this form here, this looks like a partial fraction form expansion of this. And so in fact, the betas here are related most simply to the elements in this circuit. Now, you know that if you solve the quadratic equation, the roots of a quadratic equation are much more complicated than the coefficients in general. And so this is probably not a good thing to do if really our kinetics, remember our determinants are giving us these numbers. Those are the numbers we want from a kinetic analysis. So from that point of view, this circuit is not a very good one. This one, is associated with these roots. And so again, it's not quite that good. But these ones here um, in these, this, this is, these are partial fractions. This is more a continued fraction form. These ones are not, they are more simply related to these. So that's probably good news if you're going to do kinetics. So are these ones. But we'll see that this one looks especially good for us. And if I think about that, if I want this one to be RS, then this could be CDL. 
And then this could be some other stuff. And in fact, this is just the one that we've been looking at in a slight rewritten in a slightly different way. So these numbers here, these roots, which I said I wasn't very interested in, are in fact useful for knowing what sort of circuit you can make. So there's a whole uh, area of circuit synthesis, which says, how do I take this and figure out what circuit it is? So I won't say a lot about that, except that to do that, it's useful to know where these numbers are in the complex plane. So these numbers here are all real and negative. And the ones on the bottom, if I think about if S was equal to beta one, my impedance would go to infinity. So we'll call that value of S when S becomes beta one, a pole, because it makes it go to infinity. On the other hand, alpha one, if I made S equal to alpha one, it makes the impedance go to zero. So we'll call it a zero. So I'll put exit. And so now I'm going to plot these in the complex plane, just the S plane. And so B, this is a pole, B, and this is a pole. I'm using Xs and I'll use Os for the zeros. And this arrangement here um, actually tells us something about it has to be an RC circuit. <clears throat> so let's just say a little bit more about that because it'll help, it'll help us think about when we've got a circuit that's okay or not. So these poles and zeros are related to uh, time constants. So we saw that these things were usually negative and often real. And so we want our time constants to be positive. Our time constants are negative one over the poles or zeros. <clears throat> and it turns out that if the poles are in, have negative real parts, the system is stable. It doesn't go to infinity. And I should really use admittance, as I said earlier on here. So for stability, poles have to have negative real parts. If my circuit isn't stable, I couldn't do an impedance experiment because I have to wait for DC. So I'll come back to this idea of stability right at the end. But at the moment, all I'm going to say is time constants are usually positive. And it turns out that circuits made from positive elements are usually stable, or at least semi-stable. So this is kind of technical. Um, there are conditions to get RC circuits, which I won't go over, um, but they're kind of constraining. These things have to go pole zero, pole zero. And then if I don't have that, I'll have an inductor somewhere in the circuit. So there's a, there's a bunch of circuit theory here and it can help us predict what the circuit is, what the Boda plots will look like, how complicated things will be. But just to come back to this idea, we also have ambiguities and mechanisms. So um, let's take our I equals two case, I prime equals one which was fast mass transport, one adsorbed species, non-zero steady state current. And we already looked at the hydrogen evolution reaction with three steps. <clears throat> but if I just had the first two steps, same equivalent circuit, same I and I prime. I could have the first step and the third step. So that's also another commonly uh, written down mechanism for the hydrogen evolution reaction. Or I could go a little crazy and imagine that three adsorbed hydrogens came together and made an H2 and an H plus and an oxidation step. But that one also would give the same equivalent circuit. And again, there could be different isotherms, doesn't make a difference in terms of the type of equivalent circuit we'll get. Different dependencies, potential dependencies of the rate constants could be Tafel-like or Marcus or whatever. 
you'll still get the same equivalent circuit. And again, <clears throat> you're gonna have to work at different potentials to sort out which of those circuits you've got. Because for all of these, the Faraday admittance is some constant plus some other constant over S plus C. And these constants are related to those partial derivatives. <clears throat> and so I could just, if I wanted fit my data to this, it's got the Faradayic part, I added the double layer and the solution resistance. <clears throat> and I, I could fit exactly to that, find A, B and C, and then it, by doing it at a range of potentials, figure out what these partial derivatives and kinetics were. So <clears throat> if I did that, I wouldn't have needed equivalent circuits at all. <clears throat> so why, why should we use equivalent circuits? Or maybe we shouldn't. So why do we use equivalent circuits? I think the reason is because there's a lot of equivalent circuit fitting software that's readily available. <clears throat> circuits can also be used as measurement models. And what I mean by that is uh, given by this example here, uh, if I just had some data, not any sort of data, and I wanted to know, is it a straight line? Is it a quadratic? I wouldn't approach this by saying, I'm going to fit it to a quadratic because that's what I think it is. I would first find out, okay, straight line didn't work, quadratic worked. So I've narrowed down something about my model. And if it fit, fitted neither of those, I'd have to work harder. So the same is true in EIS, right? If I find a circuit that fits, I know that my data is probably fine and I can go on and, and get that ex extract that kinetic information in a second step. If I were going to fit, I, I could take a mechanism with a bunch of rate constants, figure out what the um, impedance was, not invoke any equivalent circuits, try it out, find it didn't work, try out some other mechanism, it doesn't work. It's better to find something simple that fits and then because we know that we're gonna to have to work with the potential dependence to narrow things down. Um, this idea that circuits could be um, some sort of on the way to getting kinetics, but you will need them. And so then you can get the kinetics. Well, once you found RCT, for example, you find how it depends on potential, how the other elements depend on potential and use that to extract the exact mechanism. <clears throat> Some circuits, um, if I look at this one, these two things could be the other way around. So there's some ambiguity there. You don't know when you, if you fit to this circuit, uh, whether you'll end up with the low frequency semicircle here and the high frequency one here or the other way around. Often that, that could, for some fitting routines, that could give you a fitting problem, but most of them will decide on one or the other, but you don't know which. So, you know, this one that we've been using for hydrogen evolution reaction and other doesn't have that problem. And so in that sense, it is also a good choice. We also saw it was a good choice in terms of being most simply related to the coefficients of the rational function. So when I come back and I look at these, I think, okay, well, this one has ambiguous choices, not simply related. This one um, also has that problem, right? I could swap those two. So from those point of view, though, they are also not ones that I would go for. What about negative parameters? And I wanna say a bit about this because in electrochemistry, it turns out that resistors often want to be negative and, and maybe capacitors or inductors. And so there are two ways to do this. <clears throat> so for example, I, I've running the hydrogen evolution reaction. I know that at some potentials, 
the circuit will be this one, the impedance spectrum will be this one, and maybe at other potentials, it'll be inductive, and this will be the circuit which would work if all the elements are positive. So I got two choices. I could decide I really love positive parameters. I understand them. I'm a bit freaked out about negative ones. But the downside of that is as you change the potential, you have to change your circuit. The other option, which if you certainly if you're going to automate it, is to keep the same circle at every potential. So let's say this one. Um, and then just say, OK, even when the spectrum looks like this, I'll still fit this circuit and I'll find that some things are negative. And we'll see that when you do that, in general, because our time constant should be positive, we should keep positive time constants. OK, so let's talk a bit more about, OK, I'm going to fit to a circuit and not, not to my kinetics. So this was my kinetics. Which circuit is most simply related to A, B, and C? So here, what I'm going to do is I divided top and bottom by B here. And then I look at that and I'll say R is 1 over RCT. And then 1 over B is looking to be an inductor L. So that's a fairly simple relationship. If I measure the inductor, I take one over it and I found my B. And so that's suggesting this circuit is the one I should take. And so the, the R naught here is C over B. Now time constant was related to C. Our time constant, one over our time constant is R naught over L. So if I've got L, I then find R naught, I've got the time constant. If you use the other circuit, you'll see there's much more complicated combinations of these. So in fact, for fitting, I pretty much always use this circuit because at the end of the day, I'm after kinetics. And we'll see this, this one has another advantage as well. But, um, you know, this one's not that bad uh, and could be used. And so in general, this nested one, so I, for the one adsorbed species, that inductive one actually works quite well. But in the more general case, this nested one is actually works quite well um, and is probably the one to use. So let me come back to negative resistors again and say, why are we allowed to use those? We already saw that RP can be negative because there's something about the steady state current that goes down, which is going to be some inhibition. I made some corrosion film that decreased the current or and I've got some sort of poison or inhibitor going on. But what about the other resistors <clears throat> and resistors in general? Why are we allowed them negative? So in a passive circuit where I just take a bunch of resistors, capacitors and inductors and I solder them together and I measure something, we dissipate power. But in an active circuit, we can have a power source. And surprise, surprise, electrochemical devices can generate power. So uh, we get our power source here, a little battery. Uh, and let's suppose that it's driving a resistor. And I'm going to imagine that that power source has a larger voltage than my potentiostat, I'm driving my potentiostat at for the impedance experiment. So for example, this could be, you know, four volts, and now this is three volts. 
So that's my real circuit. Now I do my linearizing. What happens? Well, if this battery here in my circuit or power source is a true constant potential, then when I oscillate this one in my experiment, that other one stays the same. And so it's DC component, which we're not, we're throwing away when we linearize it, <coughs> doesn't come out in the equivalent circuit. But that power source has ma made our current go the wrong way through this resistor as far as what we think is going on. So when I linearize this, the equivalent circuit has a negative resistance in. The real circuit has a positive resistor in and a power source uh, and the equivalent circuit is negative. And so in general, when you've got active circuits, you're generating power, you can have negative resistances. Okay, let's think about some negative elements. We know our, this is our standard semicircle capacitor and resistor. The time constant um, is RC is positive. Now, if I make the resistance negative, now my resistor comes out into the negative region. So my arrow here is going to higher frequency. And I end up over on the other side. <clears throat> I've got a positive capacitor, negative resistor. My time constant is negative. That's probably bad. Um, and so I probably wouldn't use that circuit. We'll see there's different time constants. It does depend whether they're ones with, associated with the poles or the zeros. Okay. If I made the capacitor negative instead, I flip this thing from up this way to down this way but it still goes, you know, low frequency is still this side here because the resistor is positive. Again, I don't like that one, time constant is negative, but this one, this one here, where they're both negative, but the time constant is positive then, <coughs> this looks like an inductive loop. So in some sense, a negative capacitor coupled with a negative resistor, is like an inductor, a positive inductor coupled with a positive resistor. If I've got two time constants. Uh, I can have my inductive circuit here. And in that case, these two guys will be negative. And if I see my capacitive circuit here has these ones positive, then these two will be negative. We can have more complicated cases. So if I have two time constants here, this is my start positive semicircle. I was going here because of these positive. But now I've got a negative resistor for my low frequency. So now I've got at low frequencies, I've got one coming out into the negative region. And again, if I add one more time constant down the bottom here, it can bring me back here and I can have a hidden negative resistor. And of course, it's a differential resistor. They all are, but we usually say hidden negative differential resistor. Okay. Some circuits are easy to figure out. And so... <clears throat> This Voigt circle where I have a series resistance, inductance, and then I have these RC elements. They correspond very easily to what I see. So I've got my, that's my R infinity. My inductance is due because I'm going below the axis. You often see this in a, as wiring artifacts at high frequencies in real experiments. And then the diameters of this, Diameters of the semicircles here are R1, R2, and R3. And if I look at the top point and I find its frequency, and I go two pi times that, that's equal to omega top, which is one over a time constant. And the time constant 
is RC for this part. So each semicircle, I could look at that spectrum and I could figure out the resistance, the capacitance easily by just looking at semicircles. And so this might be very useful if you don't know what your circuit is, but you, or you don't know its values. But of course your fitting routine probably wants pretty accurate values to start your fit. You know that if, you, if you're pretty far off, then you won't get the right answer. So here's something you can do with, I've do, I'm doing it here in Maple, but I guess you could do it with Mathematica. Uh, let's imagine that you've just measured the spectrum here. It's, I, I see it's this simple, I'm gonna analyze it in the simple form. I can easily say R, which R1 is about five ohms, R2 semicircle diameter is about 100. This one's about 50. I look at the frequencies at the top. I figure out C2 and C3. And then I say, what's the impedance? And I could use my rules to say, this is what it is. And if I simplify that and the simplify command puts it in that ratio of polynomials. And I see that I've got an S squared here and I got an S squared on the bottom, are both quadratics. Let's suppose I didn't want this circuit, I, I wanted it this circuit. So this circuit and this, other, they're both those circuits must be the same. So I can write down my impedance for the circuit that I'm really interested in, simplify it, and I find also, yes, quadratic over quadratic. And I, I now have some equations that I can solve to convert from one to the other because all the coefficients must be the same. So for example, I probably can figure this one out because R1 plus R2 plus R3 is the DC path. And in this one, RS plus RCT plus RP is the DC path. So I probably could have already figured out that those agree with each other. So I could figure out, I could extract the five different coefficients there. Um, and there's five equations to solve for five unknowns. Maple has a slightly easier way of doing this, you, which says I want it to work for every S. So I use this identity thing and I'll say, I want to find these guys. It'll tell me how RCT and this circuit is related to this one. And so then I find double A capacitance, CP, RP, and RCT, and RS. So that case, you might be able to guess. Uh, there's another case here uh, where I decided to use negative capacitor and inductance here in my Voigt circuit. And here I wasn't really sure perhaps what, how to find the value of L, but I do the same thing. Here's my void circuit, here's my inductive circuit. I set them equal and out I find maybe some starting values to start fitting to this circuit. And of course, if I can do this and fit to any circuit, I can also play the same game, convert immediately to my ratio of two polynomials and then start working on the kinetics. Or I could have some fitting routine that fitted directly to that. So a lot of what I've told you is how complicated things can be or are predicted to be, but I already alluded to the fact that things are often simpler than we expect. And so I want to <clears throat> give you an example of just a flavor for why that might be. So I found this in the liter old literature somewhere. I mean, this is a fantastic thing. I have one semicircle here and then two and then three and then four and then five. So 
I have never seen five relaxations in any experiment I've done. The most I've seen is three, but almost always it's two. So I have real impedance envy here. And so why is it that often we see one semicircle or two when we know that maybe there's five adsorbed species on the surface? So there can be just some sort of detection issues. Something can be just so fast that we won't see it. And if you think about back to when we were talking about RCT and changing the field on the double layer, it takes time to charge the double layer, some microseconds. And so if in that time, the actual reaction had happened and changed what was on the surface, then we didn't really have RCT because for RCT, we're supposed to freeze the surface under the assumption that the reaction didn't take the reaction, uh, the electron tran could jump across, but the, the slower parts weren't happening. And so a good example of this is, is the hydrogen UPD reaction, which is very fast. So RCT is very small. And so you don't often see it. It's like this wasn't there. And what you typically see, unless you do a very, very careful experiment, is you just see the combination of these two capacitors, which is equivalent to just a capacitor. And so you expected to see a semicircle and then going up, but you just saw the going up. So that can happen for really fast reactions. You just don't see them. Things can be too slow to see. You can't be bothered waiting around for many months for your experiment to finish. Chances are, for any conventional experiment, you also wouldn't be waiting around. So there are always some slower things that we, we're not interested in or we, we're not going to see. When I oscillate potential, I oscillate all of the coverages and all of the concentrations at the surface and so on. And it could be that I don't oscillate them very much. And so I lose that in the noise. So that's another reason why you might have an adsorbed species on the surface, for example, but don't realize that. There's a resolution issue. If I have time constants are very close, my circles, I might have semicircles overlapping. And so I might have three semicircles overlapping and it just looks like one. Hopefully you can go to a different potential and you'll see, see them better separated, but perhaps you'd lose out on that. And then, you know, some species may not be seen for some more subtle reasons. And so here's an example of methanol oxidation where we studied this and we knew there were two species on the surface. And we knew that they got together, adsorbed OH and adsorbed CO to make CO2, but we only ever saw evidence for one. And so what we think ha happens here is that when this OH disappears, uh, very rapidly another one comes down to, it, to replace it. And so wherever you don't have CO, you have OH. And so whether you use theta OH or theta CO in your kinetic equations, there's only one thing that matters. And so the, there can be situations like that, which mean that things are simpler than they expect, you expect. But from a kinetic point of view, there's one um, reason, which is something like this. It's the idea of the rate determining step. So in general, if you've got a multi-step reaction, you know, things go on, this, comes up and these go forwards and backwards, eventually the system gets to the rate determining step. And then after it goes over, it goes all the way down. And so in this fast step, it goes so fast that any species I made there was immediately then reacted. So I don't expect to see that. On the other hand, these pre-equilibrium ones hang around. But what we find is that if I expected three semicircles and I've got one step as rate determining, and it, this is in general, I got multiple semicircles, I'll only see one if there's rate determining step. And so therefore my circuit is this very simple one. In fact, this is RP 
and this capacitance is related to it's not just CDL, but it's got some other pseudo capacitance associated with it. So we understand why the ones after the rate determining step don't appear. But what about the ones and that's just because it's the, the bang, they're gone, it's too fast. But for the pre equilibrium, what's happening? So let's imagine we had a pre equilibrium step. It's fast enough that it's almost like this. So I can write an equilibrium constant. It's a function of potential. And I can, it's also equal to theta over one minus theta. So if I solve that for theta, my theta is some function of E. And this no phase lag there. So basically, as soon as I change E, I'm changing theta. So it's as though I was changing the charge in phase with E. So every time I put a molecule on the surface, an electron goes through. So my char the effective charge that I pass is in phase with E, and that's signal for a capacitor. So we can relate the pre-equilibrium steps to a capacitor which uh, comes to this. And so these coverages are oscillating in phase with the potential because they, they're such fast steps that essentially we don't realize they're there. And so they don't contribute a semicircle. So um, there's an example of how, how this might actually work in a simulation. Um, I won't go over it in detail, but what you find is if you model it with the circuit and put all the rate constants in, you have an equilibrium constant, which is fixed, but the individual rate constants start off slow. So you're not in equilibrium and then you increase them. You go from two semicircles to one. And what's happening, basically the magnitude of L is increasing. The other, other things change a little bit, but not by much. So this is the reason why things can be simpler than you'd expect. The last thing I want to say is I didn't talk about diffusion, but diffusion can complicate things. And so if I go back to the hydrogen evolution reaction and imagine that I had both H plus and H2 and they were diffusing and their diffusion coefficients were quite different. Now my Faraday impedance is a polynomial in S, S to the half. And when you analyze that situation, in this case, I get poles and zeros on my Boda plot, which suggests that this circuit actually has only resistors in Warburg's. So I've messed things up. My, cap <clears throat> my capacity, I have adsorption but I have a circuit without either capacitors or inductors. And so things get really, really complicated in the situation where you consider the more general case. Now, most cases, you know, I, I had to really work hard to make these both, they both had to be diffusing. So my concentrations had to be special and, I, and their diffusion coefficients had to be very different in my rate constants. I had to play around with them to get that. So it's just a warning that Life isn't always simple when you go beyond and include diffusion. I was going to talk about stability, but I think I'd rather take some questions at this point. So I'll just skip over this to um, some acknowledgements for Pauline Van and Drescher, my mathematical collaborator at UVic, Frodo Salen for arranging a bunch of uh, PINS workshops. Um, a good place to look here for a starting point is this semi-review paper. And if you do want to fit to arbitrary impedance functions and you use Maple, then there's a free program there to use. So Andrew, I think I'll finish there. Uh, we have some questions. If people want to see the rest, then uh, I guess we can do that. Thank you so much, David. So it was an amazing talk. So we are open to questions. Uh, do feel free to ask directly. You can unmute yourself and start a video if you want.
So maybe in the meantime, while the audience is getting started, maybe I can start myself. So one, I, I will ask a number of questions that are probably a bit simple, but I, I think that they are important for the audience. So one of them is when you said, when you discussed um, the physical, sort of the physical meaning of the charge transfer resistance, you mentioned that it's this value is associated um, with the, the activation barriers. But when you say associated, it doesn't mean like there is a, a, so say if we see one ohm, how do we explain what means associated? So one ohm is associated with the activation barrier or is there any more direct connection rather than association? Maybe you can just comment on this because I think a lot of people have this confusion. Yeah, so I mean, a, a smaller value means a faster rate, um, but it's really the slope of, if we go back to that simple reaction, there was the, what, there is an expression for it in terms of rate constants. And so it's related to, for example, if you had a single step, it's related to the standard rate constant. And so faster reaction, smaller value, uh, but we can be more quantitative depending on you know, if there's just one electron transfer, we know that. If there's multiple, then it's a more complicated expression. I see. Um, the other question that I can ask is um, related to the case of ambiguity of the circuits, so of the of the data. So, if, like you said, we can have say one semicircuit that can be fit with three semicircuits or one semicircuit. Now. How, I mean, how, how, what is, I mean, I think this is where a lot of people encounter this situation in the lab who are not really good at impedance. How, what would you say, what would you recommend in those cases? Because so I think can, mm -hmm. th there is a question of statistics here, right? So th to decide whether it's really three closely spaced semicircles is a question about statistics. And it might be the really are three semicircles, but I can't distinguish them because I've got noise in my data. There's no real solution to that. The really are three semicircles, but you just don't realize that. So, but what I am saying is that those three semicircles probably change differently with potential. So go to some other potential and you'll find, oh yes, look, one of them's getting bigger. And so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just one, it was three or two. Um, if it's always one at every potential and statistically it seems to fit that, then it, the, the, even if it's three close together, you're never going to find out. Can I ask a question about adsorbed species? Sure. Um, I know it's it's probably too simple minded, but I mean, when you're talking about batteries, lithium ions or sodium ion, do you need to consider the absorption of the lithium ions as a separate um, uh, step compared to the charge transfer? Um, I think that I, I mean, both things can be going on uh, together. So. For example, you know, we had in, on the surface case, as I absorb a molecule, the, le the electron goes on together concerted with that. But in a multi-step mechanism, I could have electron transfer doing something and then the adsorption comes in a later step. So I think both cases can happen uh, and when you've got a system as complicated as a lithium battery, you really want to know more carefully what the individual processes are. So it could be either. Could be either, yeah. Okay, thanks. Hello. May Hello, I ask Ray. a question? Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, first, thank you for a very <laughs> nice talk. Uh, I just uh, wanted to comment on this apparent uh, paradox why sigma prime diffusion depends on kinetics. If, we got, if the process is DC reversible, of course, uh, uh, kinetic parameters are in RCT and in rate constants, uh, 
and they cancel. And we get only sigma dependent on diffusion coefficient and, uh, and concentration. Mm -hmm. So there I is think, no apparent I, I think I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, it's only a paradox if you expect, if you're somehow confused about the fact that, I mean, I, the math comes out that way, right? So I, I don't really think there's anything mysterious here, but I mean, I've certainly been reviewing papers where the author had said, oh, RCT is part of it. And the other referee said, no, it's not. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, just do the math at some point, right? But, if you do I, the I, math, I, it, it, for DC reversibility only, it uh, rate constants cancel. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's a very special case. Yeah, right. Yeah. Hi, Professor Harrington. Um, I've got a quick question on adsorbed species as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious how uh, you would map into a coolant circuits various uh, charged species that might absorb. Um, and what I mean by that is, as you said, they could either react with the electrode and that you described quite in depth, but they could also just get absorbed and happen to have charges and hence affect the equivalent circuit. Have you given some thoughts to what the best way to model these would be? Uh, yeah, I think it, it's essentially the same problem, right? I mean, there's always an ambiguity whether you actually have a bond there or whether you just have a charged species taking up some space. And so uh, I'm sure that's in the literature somewhere, uh, but it probably looks pretty much the same. If I've understood yep. you correctly, right? I mean, it take it takes up a if if it takes up a site, that's it's going to look like an adsorbed species, whether it's actually bonded to the surface and there was charge transfer or, or not, right? And and you know, it, and a charged species moving and taking up a site is also a displacement current, a charging current. So it's there are some cases when it's indistinguishable. The Faradaic and a non-Faradaic current are sort of philosophically indistinguishable in some ways. So pe people who do surface thermodynamics don't like to separate those things out. Thank you. Hi, Professor, Professor have... David. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, I just have a question regarding the, uh, the notion of uh, a DC path. I think you brought that up in slide fifteen. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in in that in that sense, do we when we say DC, do we mean low frequency or do we mean um, no, like really DC? Because I thought that we're looking at a small signal linearized model. Yeah. And well, so uh, here we are, and we're at the low frequency, low frequency. So this is the value of the resistor. I, d I never truly get here, I suppose, but the value of the resistance is, is the same as if I got there. I mean, uh, you're right. We're not actually zero frequency and it's hard to imagine what exactly what it means. So I, I just mean low enough that you know where it's going to. Is that, is that a okay answer there? It's so when I'm when I'm looking at a at a small signal circuit like this, do I should I be thinking about the 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 DC current path going through it, or should I assume that this the circuit is just valid around some bias point, some DC voltage and DC current, and only concern myself with the with the small signal, with the AC voltage and AC current? Yeah. So that that I that it's just for around a particular bias point. It, so when I say there's a DC path through the circuit, I'm not saying you can use the circuit at DC. I'm just saying the reaction mechanism has a characteristic that enables you to think about whether that circuit's okay or not. I mean, you're definitely right. There's no such thing that you shouldn't use equivalent circuits at DC. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Um, uh, Nihag, did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Professor. I want to ask like uh, for charge transfer process, we say that is uh, RCT is associated with charge transfer process. And for capacitor, it is related to the double layer charging. So when we talk about the inductor, what physical phenomena it is associated? It's associated with adsorption. Yeah. Just the adsorption. All right, great. Uh, Thank you. Um, maybe I can, yeah. Maybe I can ask now one question from uh, one of our chats, uh, where a person asked about the suppressed semi-circuits in fuel cells. So uh, some people fit it with the CP elements. Some people use it transmission lines. So which one would you recommend, and uh, what is your opinion about this? Well, I guess, I mean, it's a very difficult question to answer without knowing the context. I mean, I think uh, CP is a distributed time constant and so is a transmission line. So they maybe they are equivalent under some circumstances. So I think it's generally accepted. And, and so I, I'm talking mainly about reaction mechanisms. I would, we generally accept the CPE for the double layer capacitance. Other people like to put CPEs wherever there's a capacitor, but if you do that, then you don't really understand, you're not going to be able to relate it back to the kinetics because we don't really know what that, that messes the kinetics up in some way. You mean um, that we don't quite know the physical meaning of the CPE? Yeah, not answer. in that case. No, we, we, know, we right. perhaps know it when the double layer turns into a CPE, it means some inhomogeneity across the surface. But in general, we don't know some meaning. So once you start asking which thing should I fit, uh, you need to know what, why you would do that. And so in, in something as complicated as a fuel cell, I don't really want to make any sort of judgment call on that. Thank you. Anybody has any questions? I, I saw somebody, okay. Yep, sorry, I have a couple actually. Absolutely. A bit more um, fundamental. Um, you mentioned the fact that um, we always perform potentiostatic um, EIS, apply the voltage perturbation and watch the current. But mm -hmm. is there any point at all at doing it the other way around? Would it tell us anything different or, um, or has it been done before? Because I've never- uh, People do before. do it. I mean, and, and, and I, I, I ran out of time to talk about stability, but- mm -hmm. The stability issue is different for capacitive, for potential static and galvanostatic experiments. Oh, okay. And so um, I, I guess I always, fundamentally, I always think that, you know, you change a potential, you're changing a driving force and then current or flux or something is, is the response to that. So it always seems natural to, perturb the, the driving force and measure the, the resulting flow, whereas galvanostatic mm -hmm. is kind of backwards from that. Mm -hmm. And experimentally, they, they, are, they can be harder to measure, um, but I mean, potentially they can give the same information. Okay. Um, and one more, if there's time. Um, yeah, it's also, the magnitude of the current response with respect to the voltage perturbation. Um, yeah, it, does that tell us anything about the processes happening? Yeah, um, so I guess the ratio of those two is the admittance. And mm -hmm. if you've used it a small enough signal, then whether you use, let's say, two millivolts or five millivolts, you should get the same ratio in those. Mm -hmm. So that that is what we typically measure. Yeah. But you could go you could go to higher amplitudes, and then then it's no longer linear, and then there is some information that you could get that you wouldn't get in a regular impedance experiment for sure. Oh, okay. And people have measured, you know, higher amplitude 
um, impedances and also higher harmonics and so on. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Stan, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I was wondering about the effects of stability of the reference electrodes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm I'm just starting to do some impedance measurements in the uh, three electrode setups for the batteries. And I've been reading some papers saying that actually lithium reference that is being used in those in those cells is not a perfect reference. Um, it has some SEI layer on top, and as a result, it has some artifacts. Uh, <clears throat> and I wonder if actually it's a standard procedure to measure some kind of stability of the reference electrode uh, before you do actual impedance, and then um, somehow correct for that. Um, could you comment on that? Well, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know a lot about those particular types of reference electrodes, but your reference electrode should have a low impedance itself or you're gonna get into trouble. So I guess measuring that separately um, would be a good way of, you know, figuring out whether that's, that's going to be a problem. I mean, in solution elect electrochemistry, people often use reference electrodes which have a little bit too high impedance and then they bypass them with a platinum wire on a capacitor just to solve that problem. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what the equivalent to that would be in, in lithium batteries. Right, thank you. Um, I, I think that maybe I can ask a quick question related to just a follow-up question to what you just said. Um, so when people use, a, a, um, say for example, a platinum wire as a shunt to a reference electrode or high frequency part, to make sure that you can use it in a three electrode cell. Um, we already discussed it previously, but I, I just want to hear your opinion. Do you think it's important to use an equivalent circuit that would describe all three electrodes? Or we can just focus, we can treat that uh, platinum wire plus the real reference as a reference by itself. And then we have a working electrode. And we just use a regular uh, circuit analysis for our working electrode. Mm. I guess my real answer to that would be, if you have to put a platinum wire in a shunt, then maybe you should just go away from that and use a hydrogen reference electrode with a low impedance to start with, if you're worried about those sorts of things. Um, nobody ever does that, of course. But um, that that would be the ideal to change your actual reference electrode. People tend to use them successfully and not worry about it. I'm not aware that it leads to any particular artifacts, but I don't know. And I guess if you're worried about, if you think there's an artifact, then measuring the impedance of the reference electrode in a separate experiment, I guess, always makes sense. Uh, okay. Yes, because many of those references that we have to use in say alkaline electrolytes or uh, some others where we cannot put platinum uh, as a reference. Uh, in those ones, in those references, the commercial ones especially, they're quite, they have quite high impedance. Mm. Um, so yeah. Okay, uh, I saw somebody wanted to ask a question. Okay, maybe I can, I can, okay. Andre, did you yeah, want to may, ask maybe I, maybe I could comment on that. Yes. Uh, it is a bit tricky to work with this platinum electrode with the capacitor. We found that if the capacitance was of the capacitor was too large, there were some deformations of impedance curves. So it must be very, careful but uh, in alkaline solutions we have used mercury uh, oxide uh, electrode which is perfect and you can make it with large size and uh, low impedance but as david said you have to measure impedance of your reference electrode especially with, when you use some commercial with plaques and probably high high impedance and eliminate this. 
Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, okay. I would like to also ask a question about complex electrodes. So many of the slides show the platinum hydrogen system. And that system it can be studied, of course, in single crystals. It's very easy to sort of model it because the system itself is modal. Um, but when it comes to what often people study is the mixture of, say, carbon and other particles, since all on one um, RD electrode or even a simple electrode, then you have multiple pathways for the capacitance and, and sometimes even for the reaction. So what is your opinion about doing impedance of such electrodes? Is it an overly complicated electrode or you can still use certain approximations? Well, I think there, there is a theory for those sorts of electrodes, which uh, shows you how to, how to, to do it. Um, it's not something I've ever done just because I like to work with well-characterized systems, but I mean, people do use porous electrodes and carbon pastes and things like this. And you, there are ways to model those, which includes some, you know, analysis of the individual paths, perhaps assuming random structures and so on. So there is a whole literature about that, that, that I don't really know a lot about. Okay. So maybe it was this, we will wrap it up for today. So David, thank you so much for coming here and for making such an amazing talk. I think we covered a lot of new things that we didn't discuss previously in the previous colloquium on impedance. And thank you so much for, of course, making it possible for all of us to come at this time, because I know it's very early in the morning back on the well, Pacific coast. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Thank you.